I don't have a uh, scholarly, elegant way of addressing this problem because it sure is a problem. So I'll take it. I'd like to take a different cut at it altogether. See, for for a course like this, there's almost an endless number of possibilities in the way of what I call clotheslines to pin our ideas on themes to run through. Self is a good one, the prosthesis is another, and they're intimately and inextricably related. When we try to address traditional, cultural, historical perspectives of nature, uh, constructions of reality, if you like, when we do that, we're studying that portion of the prevailing paradigm, forgive me for using the word for the shorthand, but we all know what we mean by it. Studies of that part of the prevailing system of ideas and ideology, and also of past, earlier consensuses of reality that have to do with social and traditional perceptions of the relationship between us and everything else. Very important at the outset to recognize and all agree that that relationship obviously is a perception only. And unfortunately, when we talk about relationship, we're expressing a dichotomy, no matter how we express it, between A and B, between me and nature. So when we speak of humans and nature, Unfortunately, we're still revealing an assumption of dualism, aren't we? No matter how uh, well-intentioned we may be, and uh, in our expression thereof, we're still expressing a dualism. Now, it could be said that that's simply a necessary price you have to pay for communication. I'm not sure about that, but I'll let it rest at that for the moment. There's no other way of talking about it except to objectify it, except to separate it from me. I don't know. But this is obviously one of the root problems through the course. I'm not going to attempt to answer that, by the way. So, the concept of self, I shall assert for working purposes here, is an expression of duality or dualism. Because what does it necessitate? The concept of self necessitates the concept of other. So we have a dualism right from the starting blocks. <coughs> now I have suggested before that <coughs> one way of looking at this me other or human other problem is to see the paradigm as a prosthetic device. Okay. A surrogate set in place by culture for natural, inherent, intrinsic ways of being alive. But do remember, and I'm repeating, I know what I said last time, but it's important to remember that the prosthesis is not some kind of whim. It's not some kind of happenstance. It's necessary. We couldn't function without it. We must have it. We have to have it in order to function, if only as social beings that we are. And we'll continue to need it just as long as we persist, I believe, in denying our biology, our animalness our biological being and our historic cultural read your Berman etc read your Evendon read your Livingston our historical cultural rejection of our own biology means that we have to have this artificial device to uh, to replace it or some kind of device to replace it so the prosthesis turns out to be the paradigm the set of beliefs and assumptions revealed truths the culturally conditioned perceptions of reality that allow us to function as social beings in a reasonably orderly way. Now, it doesn't matter what paradigm, please remember that, because they change over time, they have always. Any paradigm will do, but no paradigm will not do. See, it doesn't particularly matter whether the artificial leg is made of wood or plastic or aluminum. That doesn't matter so long as it fulfills its supportive role. Which is part of the reason, as you'll discover 
as you plow through the material related to these subjects, that very, very few environmental thinkers, ones that we know about, prominent people, are ideologues. Very, very few. Because uh, anyone will do. The brand is irrelevant. The brand of ideology is irrelevant. Things are the same in the Soviets and here in this respect. It doesn't matter what, what the ideology is. So long as the problem, as it appears to be to me, so long as the problem is ideology itself. I think that the human species is the, I make that into a verb for me, somebody, the ideologizing zing species, the species that creates ideologies in order to function. Now, Neil has suggested in some of his work, Neil Erdman, that perhaps what most deeply offends the humanists about so-called deep ecology or ecosophy or whatever is its challenge to ideology. One of the most fundamental things in the structure of deep ecology is its challenge to ideology. So perhaps our problem, as we are beginning to unwrap it, is not so much ideology. It certainly isn't the contents. It's not a problem. The problem may be the need for ideology, the need for the prosthetic device. Now. I reckon that's the problem. I myself think that's the problem. Now, it's this prosthetic device that allows us to go through all the rational, intellectual convolutions and contortions with which we're all entirely familiar, having to do with our, meaning our species, transcendence of natural, animal, nastiness and brutishness which transcendence has been with us in print at least since the 17th century and in fact long before that. Now we usually transcend our societies, usually transcend natural brutishness through our ethical systems. That's the most obvious route that we take to transcend nasty, dirty, brutish uh, genes, the living genes we have. Ethical systems may turn out, because they are ideologies, to be one of the most important building blocks in this cultural edifice. I see it as a sort of Eiffel Tower, this cultural edifice of human separation from nature. I think so. Now, I reckon, and this is interesting, I, I would guess that perhaps more intellectual contortions have been invested than anywhere else in the challenge, in the attempt, in the pathetic attempt to demonstrate absolute human uniqueness. Which, of course, is a, a bit of an empty phrase because all species are by definition unique, aren't they? But we like to trumpet that we are in, you know, unique. For a long time, we took, uh, until almost the present, you know, one's own lifetime, we took absolute human uniqueness for granted. But these days we're having to work at it. In other words, we're having to work at it to demonstrate it a little bit harder than we used to have to. We took it as given before. It's it's funny, isn't it? it it's it's almost a paranoia the, uh, when you read uh, the outpourings of those who want to prove that we are unique. It doesn't seem to be good enough that every individual is unique and that every species is a unique event. Everything alive is a unique event. That's not good enough not good enough for the humanist anyway to be just one unique event among millions upon millions upon millions I find that most beautiful but the humanists don't seem to we have to be uniquely unique no all right all species are unique Abraham Lincoln all species are unique but one is more unique than the others which is more than just bad English bad English to start with but it's more than that more unique than others Long since, you see, in our in our search for uniqueness, we've had to give up on various characteristics that we took to be unique. Tool using, then tool making, then language, then traditions and cultures. All these had to be jettisoned as we went along. All this in our own time. Even abstraction. See, problem solving is abstraction, damn it. 
and lots of beings, including even invertebrates, problem solve. We had to give up on teaching and learning because this is evident all around us. We had to give up on cooperation and strategizing, which is conceptualizing and abstraction. Strate if what is strategizing if it isn't abstraction? Okay. It doesn't leave an awful lot left, does it, for our uniqueness? But the ultimate fallback position, and there's always an ultimate fallback position, the central jewel in the crown of human uniqueness has always been self-awareness. But then along came, this was torpedoed about 20 years ago by a little child, a little chimpanzee child called Washu. Washu was now a grown, aging chimp with grandchildren, but at the time she was a little shrimp, and she was being raised in experiments, in the first experiments in sign language, remember they taught chimps to sign in the American Sign Language. Uh, she was the first one who did this. And one, there was a mirror in her place where she was living with these people. And, uh, there was a, a good-sized mirror up against the wall, and she'd look in it from time to time. And after the, she'd learned to speak quite fluently, they, they said to her, Wash you, what's that? She looked in the mirror and signed, that's me. Now, the world has never been the same since, because this shattered, uh, uniquely human self-awareness went on and on and on, and she did many other things. But that one was the was really throwing a grenade right into the midst of the anthropological, sociological, primatological uh, communities. And she did it over and over again. It was quite clear that she knew what she was talking about. Anyway, so Washu, dear little thing, was self-aware. So what were we going to do about that? Panic, pandemonium reigned. Well, of course, what we did, this is, gets really tricky. I'm not saying it's conspiratorial because uh, you've heard me speak about conspiracy before. So what we do about that? What we did was we point out, and this is really neat and tricky, that Washu wasn't aware that she was self-aware. <laughs> this, this, this dead serious, dead serious is published everywhere. Rigid defense of, of the humanistic position. It's absolutely true this was said. Not in these words, but I mean this is what was said. Now we couldn't know that. Obviously we could not know that. How the hell could we know that? But it was very important, see, to the collective self-esteem that we asserted anyhow, ultimate fallback position. Okay. The human uniqueness then is awareness of self-awareness. I'm only being ever so slightly tongue-in-cheek about this. It's pretty straight stuff in the literature. I haven't a shred of doubt that once we find other species aware of self-awareness and can no longer deny it, then we'll plead that we, on the other hand, are aware of our awareness of our self-awareness. And I'm only mildly teasing because this is the kind of stuff that you read. Now, self-awareness has a terrible way of muddying the waters in most discussions of, oh, what? Vivisection, let's say, is it? An example here, self-awareness meaning sentience. Well, that's the way it's used in that context. It's okay to commit the unspeakable <coughs> cruelties on beings which are not self-aware. So it's in our interest, at the interest of our conscience, to see them as not being self-aware, so that we can barbarize them. Why well, I've never understood, but this is the way it goes. But even if those beings were not self-aware, would that justify a cruelty? Well, that's a different question altogether. Anyway, self also comes into environmental ethics, naturally enough. In a very oversimplified way, ethics has to rest on moral philosophy. And moral philosophy ultimately has to rest on the concept of the individual. There's no place else for it to begin. Presumably, the concept of the individual has to rest on the concept of the self. I don't see how it could not. So perhaps we could say that non-human beings, sentient beings, don't require ethical systems because they're not self-conscious. This is one of the things that's popularly said in the humanist literature. Or we might say that they don't require ethical systems because their self-consciousness transcends the individual. It's a more, much more interesting way of looking at it. I think they don't require ethical systems, as you will have gathered, because they are whole complete. They don't require replacement parts. And I see ethical systems Sorry. as replacement parts. 
replace this is a Canadian tire that dispenses replacement parts of these kinds. Now I say this not from scholarly research, obviously because it ain't there in the scholarly literature, but as a naturalist, I just like to look at animals and see what they do. It strikes me that the role of uh, self in non-human beings is completely different from its role in uh, human cultures, especially in, in the West here. It seems to me that for all sorts of historical reasons we'll talk about another time, in our culture there's an inordinate estimate on the individual self, inordinate to emphasis on that. Everything has to be individual self. And that individual self inordinately emphasized is at the expense, I do believe, of other forms of self which is possible to see in non-human beings. Another form of hyper-specialization, if you like, the way I talked about it last time. Non-human beings, thus, wild ones at any rate, not to rescue, but wild ones, are not the slaves of the cultural processes. A lot of years ago, uh, I was part of a research group doing a lot of work on birds, mostly, and we were retained to do continuing studies on the problem of bird fox bringing down jet aircraft. Guilty parties were often balls of starlings, you know, how they fly in balls and they get into a, into a jet engine, or balls of uh, shorebirds and flocks of gulls and stuff like that. We did an awful lot of work on this all over the world, actually. And this, just as a matter of interest, involved studies of migration and weather, and we learned how to use radar at airport installations to tie in with weather and bird movements according to, movement. you know, they like to ride lows and that kind of thing, so we could anticipate them how to pick up the bird fox on the radar, all that kind of stuff, radars on, radars, aerograms on the airports. But one of the most interesting things to me at this time was flocks of low-flying shorebirds. Those of you who don't know anything about birds, there are a lot of little sandpipers that uh, in migration fly around in flocks of a couple of hundred, sometimes more, in very, very tight uh, bunching in the air, and they move all move instantaneously as though they were one. I'm sure you've seen film of it if you haven't seen it in... in so we were charged with busting up those flocks. This was out of Vancouver. What's that with those great mud banks right beside the airport there? Come on, somebody must know Vancouver. There's something banks. Anyway, there's huge, enormous mile after mile of mud flats right beside the airport, which attracts in migration God knows how many hundreds of thousands or millions of shorebirds. That's where we were doing it. Could we bust up these flocks? Well, well, no, it was a legitimate question, you see. But first of all, I have to know how the flock is glued together. You know, they have hundreds in the size of this, almost, you know, this table. Uh, how are they, what's, what's gluing them together? Well, we tried, it's not visual signals, we did everything, slow motion photography, believe me, we did everything. Uh, wasn't visual, it was just too fast to be visual. Not audio either, I reckon maybe audio, maybe in some range, some frequency that we couldn't hear. So we rigged up stuff and tried to jam assumed signals at, uh, at a frequency that we can't uh, hear. Did not work. Well, I didn't keep trying. So I started to reflect upon this. I thought, could we have here one mind? Just to abbreviate the thing. You've read the paradox. I mentioned, I think, this in that article. I can't remember for sure, but <clears throat> could it be one mind? No. The coordination of one single organism, a single little bird, requires an enormously complicated, complex network of neurological apparatus. We all know about that. But these neurological connections don't jump through the air, or do they? I, I, I brooded about that for a very long time, watching, trying to understand what's going on. Then, a little bit later, I was able to spend the, the year, virtually, poking and probing around coral reefs uh, and about schools of tropical fishes and I suddenly saw top fish doing exactly the same thing as these dunnins were doing the same phenomenon exactly. So the question arises, could there be some kind of group self? Not just extended self in the sense of proprietorship, those keys are mine, that part, I don't mean that. A group self here, perhaps, where the sense of individuality is transcended by one mind, a greater sense of self allowing that whole school of fishes, 
for that whole flock of Dunlans and Starbirds to behave as one being, not to behave as one being, to be one being. I think there is, and I call it group self. Scientists are still studying that. Well, depending on the species, of course, I'm not generalizing to everything. I call it group self for now. Now, group self is obvious, it's undeniable in these groups of shorebirds on the mudflats, or a tight school of, uh, of fishes. But we have to think then of an aggregation of beings that's not quite as tightly organized as that. Uh, we also have to think of those birds or fishes in the breeding season when they're going to be dispersed, at least the birds are. And in the latter case, in the breeding time, I think the, uh, the group self shrinks just to the number of the family and its locality. That's easy enough to comprehend. But of course, precious individualism that we hold so highly in such great esteem wouldn't help much in the breeding season, would it? So there's got to be more than individualism. There's got to be at least a two and then a batch of young, plus the habitat. I'll talk about that later. There are in many birds a magic number below which they will not breed anyhow. And this is mystified uh, mystified biologists for years. If you reduce a, a, a flock of oh, some of the sea nests, uh, some of the hawks, let's say, uh, those beyond a certain level in their traditional colonies, the damn thing simply won't nest. What is this all about? Lots of speculation. Nobody knows. Now, in the other case, that uh, when you think of social groups as in maybe an extended family of primates of some kind, monkeys, baboons, apes, whatever. And we've always known that these were social and cohesive in some way. I've watched a lot of groups of social primates, a lot of them. Holler monkeys and spider monkeys and baboons and vertebrate monkeys and all that stuff. And they all behave much the same. As I, I think I indicated the other day, they, they move around a lot. They're moving all the time, really, feeding. And, little, and individuals will make little individual forays beyond the immediate uh, group. But whenever there's any kind of cause, danger, whatever, they instantly coalesce, instanter. And they're watching each other all the time for clues and signals. Even when they don't appear to be watching or listening, or somehow they pick up the behavioral consensus, if I can put it that way, from moment to moment. They behave as one being. Now, looser still, in terms of physical sprawl, are herds of the hoofed animals all the zebras and wildebeestes and mountain sheep and whatever it might be. But still they're within seeing distance, all these. All. And again, they seem to behave in concert. I don't know how. They behave as though each individual knows where the others are from moment to moment. Bears do, too. Some animals disperse even more widely than these ungulates do, these hoofed animals. At least you wouldn't call social at all. That's where bears came up the other day. Now, bears we usually think of as being loners. This is somewhat inaccurate. Those mature females nearly always have one or two two-year-old youngsters with them. The males tend to forage alone, but they gather where there's food, salmon runs or dumps or whatever it might be. And incidentally, I've never seen any fighting at any of these gatherings, even in, even in Churchill, where you get polar bears coming out of your ears, but they're not fighting. They're, they're doing their stuff. But bears just have to forage widely. They've got to. But the funny thing is, and this is what I was saying the other day, that they always seem to know where everybody else is, no matter how far away they are. Uh, Shepherd, uh, Paul Shepherd says a book called The Sacred Paw. I'm quoting him now. Uh, a long, nice paragraph. If socialization is defined by living in packs or year-round mate association, then bears are solitary. But perhaps the net of bear sociality is cast so wide the primate observers like men with their poorer senses of smell and hearing cannot appreciate its subtlety and its scale. If bears have in their heads a constantly revised map of the location of other individual bears, should we not consider them as truly socially oriented? And I would agree with his rhetorical question and say yes. I think it might advance our understanding a little bit if we were to move from say, a socially constructed construction of reality to some other dimension altogether, a extended group self, then we might be getting somewhere, I think. 
After all, why force fit all the time? Why force fit sociality with all of its ethicals and, you know, other prosthetic imperatives on beings who don't need it? Why should we project all this stuff upon other beings? I don't understand it. So now I think we're coming closer to what Neil Everenden has expressed in his book, his fields uh, of self. And I'm very, I'm very attracted by that image, and I'll use it, I'll speak about it another time in another context. On the tundra, see, then, when I watch, I can perceive bearedom, if I can put it that way. It's a great Jeezley field containing several units, individual bears within a net, as Paul Shepard calls it, of extended bear self. So it's got to be something like that. Now, I'm suggesting here a group self and a group self-consciousness. The individual dunna, the individual little sandpiper, conscious of the greater self of which it's part. The individual fish, the bear, the howler monkey, whatever. So, viewed in this way, view these phenomena in this way, then we're no longer shackled and fettered and handcuffed by these terribly slippery definitions of sociality. Chuck it. Group self. Dare I say, as Berman suggests, a species of participating consciousness. Well, I think that I like that notion, and I think I like, the, the, as, as Berman describes it. I think so. Just look at a beehive or a termite hill or a seabird colony or a school of dolphins or anything, or, my lord, a herd of elephants. <clears throat> now, just for a moment, uh, sentience. Um, we say an individual organism is sentient if it's aware of and responsive to external stimuli. Uh, that's the simplest ground level definition. It's at least to some extent autonomous in its individual actions, individual responses. I'd say that it's self-conscious as an individual if it can perceive a choice between two options and is capable of exercising that choice. I think that's reasonable enough if it can perceive a choice and, and act on it. The matter of intentionality comes in here, obviously, self, other, subject, object, whatever. Now, whether a definition like that might or might not include at least some forms of plants, I can't say. I suspect it probably does. I once had a graduate student who had a spider plant who loved him and hated me. This is true. It would approach him, I think because he smoked pot and he liked the, the plant liked it. Uh, the smell of it or something. Anyway, it would, it would swing towards him. I would come and it would uh, avoid me. Anyway, subject object, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, whether that includes plants, I don't know. Can I ask a question at this point? Or is this I'd rather you didn't. Okay. Because I want to make the argument. It would seem to include all animals, this choice-making, that are mobile, or at the very least, motile. Obviously, that suggestion is just as unprovable as the prevailing one, that only we are self-conscious. That's not provable either. So my hypothesis is no more valid than conventional wisdom, but remember it's no less valid either on the evidence that we have. See, I'm in process of suggesting that individual self-consciousness is the most basic, the most fundamental, the most radical form of consciousness individual self consciousness the basic one. But the strange thing is that in Western societies, at least, individual self-consciousness, individual self-awareness, has been elevated and raised to such a pinnacle of importance that we've utterly forgotten about group self-consciousness, group self-awareness. This individuality and individuation I'll talk about another time. You realize that had this hyper-specialization on individual self being the result of biological process rather than cultural process. We can see it as a terribly hazardous venture out onto an evolutionary limb, but it didn't happen that way because evolutionary process reacts very harshly to hyper-specialization. But of course we got away with it because it's just in our heads, not in our biology, and that's how we got away with it. 
I'd argue that in the course of our cultural evolution, not our bi uh, biological evolution, but our cultural evolution, we trade it off, whether consciously or not. Are they more sophisticated, more appropriate, more mutualistic, more integrative, dare I say, higher forms of consciousness for the one with which we have decided to live? The role of Christianity and other monotheistic religions is in promoting that aberration, of course, incalculable. So I, I posit the following. I posit this, that individual self-consciousness, self-awareness, may be not only the most basic and fundamental form of consciousness, but in an evolutionary sense, also the most primitive, to use another word, beloved by the humanists, I'd suggest that this primitive form of consciousness underlies more developed forms of consciousness in much the same way as the so-called primitive reptilian brain is said to underlie more recently, more recently formed cortical stuff, cortical material. So if we have to talk in progressive terms, I would see that if we must, and we apparently we must, in Western society, that top book progress. I see the group self as a bit of an advance over the individual self, whether in an evolutionary context or any other way, it doesn't matter. But we don't need to see it as progress. We don't have to see it that way. It just suits our society to see things as being progressive. The individual self has an indispensable function for newborns, doesn't it? Absolutely indispensable for newborns. The newborn, as a sentient creature, has to have a starting point, has to have a reference point for everything that's going to happen thereafter. And I reckon that individual self is it. It must be. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But that, and I'll develop that further, but that individuality is soon subordinated, damn soon subordinated, really, in, in terms of elapsed time, to the greater need which is the need of the group. Very soon in infancy, eh, the newborn is assimilated into the greater consciousness, which is that of the group, the family around it. It doesn't take it very long, so I understand the literature, to, to give up identifying itself as the core of a self-centered universe. There's another way in which it drops that, obviously, and becomes part of the group, part of the community. There are two ways of seeing this infant thing as being the self, as being the core of a self-centered universe, or you could say the infant maybe is the whole universe, not just the center of the universe, but is the whole universe. I think this is possible also, not self-centered. Maybe it doesn't need a self-core to center on I me. Mean, it is the, the world for a few precious months. Anyway, it it turns into a participant in a family-centered universe. Clearly, it does that relatively soon, which I can see is a group self-consciousness. And where the process moves from there, I think, depends entirely on the biology of the species that we're talking about, the ecology, the life history of the species, where it goes from there. For bears, it's a pretty loose arrangement. For wasps, it's hyper-concentration. It doesn't much matter. It doesn't matter at all, in fact because the principle is the same. Now we come to a level that's an awful lot more problematical. Uh, beyond the group consciousness, I will cheerfully posit a community consciousness. It's more problematical because uh, the conventional wisdom has no alternative, really, but to grant the existence of a group self-interest, at the very least, in beings that are obviously social. But the construction of an ecologic reality would have more difficult in seeing a self-interest in terms of groups of species, groups of species and associations, and of course community. Now we're talking multi-species situations. But of course the most basic premise of ecology, interrelatedness I guess is the most basic, is all about mutualism. What else after all is it about if it isn't about mutualism? 
Now, it would be anthropomorphic to talk about mutual aid. We leave that to Peter Kay. So instead, we talk of mutualism instead of mutual aid. And mutualism is a perfectly respectable word in biology. The mutual aid is not, because we're not allowed to see non-human animals offering aid. So, instead of that, we talk about reciprocity. And we can begin freely to talk about reciprocity now, out of studies in ethology. So for it seems to me to be, we can speak reciprocity now. It's okay, chaps, you can. This is new. It seems to me to be undeniable that any natural community, let's say a beaver pond or something like that, or a mangrove island, one of these, has got a self-interest in its continuance as a, as a whole. All participants in that community, all conscious participants in that community, are in the business of maintaining that community. Remember that the thrust of biological activity and of evolutionary uh, activity is conservative. It is ultra-conservative. Animals and plants and communities are in the vested business of maintaining the status quo, always. Romer, Al Romer, who used to be the head of the paleontology at Harvard, used to say, he had a thing called Romer's Rule, it was called Romer's Rule by others, not by him, about the conservatism of evolutionary process because the fight is to maintain, to go on living the old ways and doing the old things under changed circumstances. What are our native Indians if they're not ultra-conservative because they want to keep on with the old ways? However, the context for doing those old ways changes because things are changing all the time. So in trying to perpetuate the old ways of doing, whether it's a stranded fish or whatever, you struggle more and more to keep doing the old ways and some anomaly in your midst becomes a new species. The coelacanth, the rumor thing was, the coelacanth, you know, the lungfish stranded on the beach, was trying not to turn into an amphibian. It was trying desperately hard to find water. And it fought to get in to breathe. And it had these little stubby, funny fins. And they were strong enough to enable it to get to water. And its fins got... Uh, so it was that drive to get to the water that all of a sudden he found he could run on the land. And lo and behold, evolution had delivered the first uh, terrestrial animal. But it was in his paroxysm of fear, if it were, if it were put it that way, to get to some, another pond that caused him to walk in the first place. Conservatism of evolutionary adaptation is the point. That's all. The self-interest in a, in a group of species, just like the self-interest of a community of the same species, is just as clear, it seems to me, in ecology. Uh, it's the self-interest of a group of the same species. There's no difference. Now the question is, does each species, and by extension, each individual of each species, have an awareness of what we might call the greater enterprise, for lack of some other way of expressing it. The greater enterprise being simply living. I think it's possible. Biologists, you know, are wont to say that the greater enterprise is reproduction. I deny that. The greater enterprise is hacking it long enough to reproduce. First things first. Hacking it becomes before reproduction. The greater enterprise is living. I think that's possible that they're aware of that. We've already mentioned, uh, or I haven't, uh, I guess, I can never remember which course I'm in. Barry Lopez and his wonderful, wonderful book on the wolves, of Wolves and Men, talks about, and I've written it up somewhere else, about the conversation of death, as he calls it, when the wolf and the caribou lock eyes, and they know, and they both know, what's now going to happen, be played out, as it were, in a, a ritual as old as life. That is between predator and prey, but wouldn't we be justified in seeing it as a conversation also of life? Because I do. I think the wolf and the deer are not, not the only participants 
in the conversation of life. In the beaver pond, down below my house, there's thousands of participants of hundreds of species. That's what ecology is all about, is conversation of life. Now, whether community self-interest is translatable into community self-consciousness is a big leap. I certainly can't show it scientifically, meaning mechanically. Can't show it mechanically. But to paraphrase, good old Aldo you-know-who, if what seems good is good, and I agree with that, if it seems good, it usually is good, and the community self-interest can scarcely be denied, then the community self-consciousness feels pretty good to me. The reciprocal behavior, see, I'm going to write with the the reciprocity is quite evident, ecological, if only ecological reciprocity, of multi-species communities, things that go on. The sheer beauty of all these interrelationships, of all the participants doing their stuff and reciprocating, seems to me to scream an aware, some kind of collective awareness of the collective. Now, ecologic succession is generally about plants that you know because plants are the art sticks that we most often use to to uh, describe community but of course every stage in plant succession everybody knows what plant succession is has a different set of animal species go along with it eh? at every stage from the grass through the shrubs to the small trees to the larger trees to the mature unchanging forest there's different animal species that go along with it as it goes now Ecologists are wont to see plant succession as driven by competition, which I utterly, flatly deny, and I'll talk about another time. Because it's just as easy to see plant succession as driven by cooperation. It is just as easy on the same evidence, absolutely. Rather than, see, contesting a piece of ground, plants in successional process appear to me at least to prepare chemically in every other way the ground for the next lot obviously this is what is happening that the pioneer so called pioneering plants are chemically and otherwise preparing the humus for the next lot that's going to come in that doesn't look like competition to me and of course for the next lot of animals also they're both anthropomorphisms and I do not deny it for a moment they're both anthropomorphisms competition and cooperation the beaver prepares a pond for the trout, doesn't he, effectively, and for moose, and for the wolves who like both beavers and moose, and so on. Each is the preparer and the provider and the supplier for the other, reciprocally. And if there is this uh, conversation of life, as I paraphrased Lopez, between two individuals of two different species, why not among many individuals of many species? Why not? simply the same phenomenon magnified. I think so. And if there is conversation, ergo there must be self-awareness, even at the most basic level, the most primitive level of the individual. In other words, the individual in this context is the primitive, but society is something more advanced than the individual. Is this sounding like ecological fascism? Please forgive me. Ecology always sounds like fascism. So, I think that individuality is not what natural process is all about. Individual participants, that's all. Finally, I'd like to be able to posit and to argue a wider biospheric consciousness, a consciousness of the whole, the whole. I don't mean by this a rationalist, humanist, noosphere, that kind of thing. But rather, you know, the Tayyar but rather I mean an awareness of planetary biospheric self to extend Berman a total participating consciousness why does participating consciousness have to be cut off at the level of the community or the group I see no point in that but of course when you do get a total consciousness what has vanished other has vanished the concept of other has now been garbaged because you don't need it. Now, at, at earlier, lower stages, if you like, more primitive stages, stages, the concept of of other 
is very important, and it's most important at the individual level, because only one individual, me, against the world when I'm an infant. Less other is less important at the group level, family level. It melts away very fast indeed at the community level where you have interspecies activities going on. It's gone at the whole level of the biosphere. Now, for our own cultural reasons, which I leave to you to figure out for the rest of your uh, master's time here, we choose to remain, for whatever reasons, at the most elemental, at the most infantile level, which is individual self, self versus other, the most primitive and infantile way of seeing the world that one can imagine. Normally, we, we uh, outgrow it. Our culture likes to have us not outgrow it. For reasons I'll come to another day. Now, this series of self consciousnesses, plural. Uh, we can move from the ecological to the individual. We can see it as an ontogenic process or a developmental process in the individual human being. This fall for not coming. I said this. I suggested that the prosthesis has its own vested interest, as it were, its own vested self-interest interest in self-perpetuation. And that present, prevents us as individuals from reaching the more mature levels of consciousness, which would be represented by group consciousness, interspecies, and biospheric self. Because were we to be allowed to do this, the whole humanistic ideological infrastructure would implode. And let's not forget all the sundry vested interests in the paradigm, of course, from technology to philosophy to humanities to science and lots and lots more. Science both hard and soft, I would say to you. But the news is not all that bad. No, it's not all bad at all. I suggest that as biological beings, we can't divorce ourselves from our being anyhow. We can only imagine that divorce. We can pretend to be divorced from my biology, which is, of course, what we do, but we can't achieve it. As sentient beings, we still have access, and I believe most firmly, that we have access all the time, simultaneously, to all those four levels of consciousness. We always will have, because we remain sentient biological beings. So what we're after, I'm suggesting now, is not this terrible, um, Maslow's uh, self-actualization or self-realization, which is so terribly goddamn selfish, it's stuck at the primitive individual level. Rather, we're after self-recovery, are we not? Through a deeper understanding, and, you know, eventual remedial work on the paradigm itself. I see it, all graduate studies as remedial work. The abandonment of the pr prosthetic crutch and the recognition and the recognition, a much better way of saying that word, of our own biology. Now, Paul Shepard, my buddy Paul Shepard, posits a species gone mad. Or, as he might more politely put it, a species of arrested development, both at the individual and the group and the social and the cultural level. That's in the book Nature and Madness. I can take you through this now. It's mad because it cannot, it does not mature. A society of arrested development. As individuals in this despotic culture we live in, we never reach wholeness. We're a species of arrested development full of individuals of arrested development. And now he postulates a three matrix theory, Shepard does, and I'm going to do his thing on the board, then I'll do my own thing on the board after. Now, uh, yeah, well, I'll put this, I'll put this on. This is from Nature and Madness, but this isn't the same one. It's a, it's a further uh, development of the one that's in Nature and Madness. We have two, we have, please don't take more of it than is there. 
But there is a female side to all of us, and there's a male side to all of us. Accept that. Now, on the, for the sake, sake of developing a matrix, on the female side, he emphasizes unity and symbiosis. The male side, he emphasizes, and this is not pejorative, separation and autonomy. And in our individual development, we go through a series of spirals. Birth obviously begins with the Indian symbiosis, but it's very simple. Separation, birth by definition, is being separated. There's birth there. B is for birth. Then he postulates a series of bondings that happen in order to make the individual complete. The first bonding is clearly right back here to the face and the body and the voice of, uh, of the mother. Okay. So bond number one in the matrix one is the bond to mother, okay? The first and the most necessary and all of that stuff. Now, it spirals though that now we're talking about toddlers, eh? This toddler starts to toddle away from mother and go this way towards what he calls the first patridge as distinguished from the bonding to the mother, which is infancy, which is toddler. I'll just say toddler there. Now, the critical part. Toddling around and growing up to six or seven or thereabouts. The next imprint, which is number two, bond number two, is guess what? It's to the non-human. It's the imprint of creatures and of place, of physical place. Uh, the imprint of where the, the kid is playing and the grasses and the shrubs and the rabbits and whatever is there that was playing with. So this bond to nature being absolutely fundamental and systematically denied to most of our children. Okay. Here's where the incompleteness starts to emerge in the unsuccessful, unsuccessful making, welding, bonding of this imprint upon non-human. Done all its bonding to human, now it's got to, to its greater surround, that's all. And then its departure uh, from uh, back, you know, to the, all the adventures of childhood as opposed to infancy. So that's the second patriarch on the male side. That, then finally, the final one, which is not going to be reachable if the second imprint has not been accomplished. Okay, so it's sort of deterministic in that sense. He calls initiation, leadership, whatever. It's the bond to the cosmos. It's the bond, it's where, it's where one develops one's own cosmology. In other words, biospheric being in my terminology. Okay, and this is at adolescence and, and beyond. I mean, one heavy duty, one heavy duty abstraction and cosmolizing begins to take place in adolescence. Teens, okay. Now, that, I'm not doing it justice, but I'll read you what he says about it. He says the following The spiral begins with the birth and swings. Uh, left, as I said, to the bonding with the matrix. Always toward the matrix here, the, the, the female, the mother. And to the right, when it goes over to the right side, it's toward autonomy, or to the male side, as we're distinguishing it. Now, mature individuation, as opposed to Maslowian style, mature individuation requires successful passage through three bondings and most important also, three separations. The bond has to come 
but you, the child does not become totally dependent on that bond. It has to separate and become autonomous and then, then enter into a newer, more mature level of bonding, okay? Three bondings and three separations. Matrix one is fundamental, provides the basic structure, the, ba the basic paradigm, that's the bonding to mother. Matrix two, the bonding to nature, is the one we know least about because of no interest to our humanistic tradition, whereas our, our cosmology is of consuming interest to our Western civilization. So we don't know much about Matrix two because our society not only denies it, but denies uh, that it's of any interest to explore. But what it does, it embraces the child's fascination with nature. No one can deny that fascination, even if it's kittens and puppies and geraniums on windowsills and goldfish, it doesn't matter what it is. The kid's spontaneous enthusiasm for names of things. Some of us never outgrow that, that keep lists of burn. But fascination enthusiasm for names of things. This is A, whatever it is. What is this? They're all saying to the point of, well, we all know that. What is this? And, but they all saw the natural history. Where is this word to come from? Why does it grow here? All that stuff. When you loose a child into a pond or something, a frog pond, and boy, oh boy, there are a lot of questions. And, 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 what, and what Paul Shepard says, and it's a nice, uh, the soaking in a place, the soaking in a place, just sucking it into your very being, ingesting literally this place and these animals. <coughs> that make it the basis, that make that experience of soaking in a place, actually ingesting a place, based on the intuition later of some kind of order the universe. Without a place, how can it be a universe after all? Uh, this, this can take you know, in a lot of directions. I think I'll just I'll leave for the moment. The, but that he, he likes to call to say we don't have to ship all our kids out on buses and stick them into something that we call nature, a hemlock woods up in the Boyd Conservation Area or something. That he calls it the dead cat and broken bottle syndrome. The <laughs> kids run the back alleys behind their houses and they know where the dead cat is and they know where the bottle was, the, the broken bottle, and they know where the newspapers were and they knew where everything is. And they're soaking in a place no matter where they are. They're soaking in a place and that place is the reference for them. Now, we can do something about trying to do something about the dead cat and the broken bottles, but the point is that the kid knows his area, and does he ever? Are you waving at me? Yeah. Yeah? Question. Yeah? Just to clarify something. Yeah. Um, I thought you were saying when you were doing the spiral from the matrix one to matrix two and to three, I heard that you said matrix three cannot happen without Oh, Kim, I meant cannot happen successfully. Oh, cannot happen so successfully. When we skip by, when our culture skips by number two and concentrates on number three, the thing the, that has been formed is incomplete. And now he agrees with me that it needs a prosthetic device in that incompleteness. Uh, I'm not sure about the patriarch. Patriot, oh, it's just these words. You don't, you don't have to be uh, particular. It's just when the, the, the second is is uh, childhood, that's all. Uh, moving away into into the world of abstraction and conceptualization. You know, uh, conceptualization. Rather than experience, this tends to be the the intellectual side of this tends to be the experience, that's all. The distinction isn't terribly important for this purpose. So the first level, he says, is an active. I don't know what he means by that, but that's what he says. The second level being iconic, nature, and the third, symbolic. And if we don't understand, if we don't have our icons, our places, our selves being greater than ourselves, then how in the world can we enter the symbolic and entertain any kind of cosmology at all? As he says, the religious concepts 
of phase three, matrix three. And, the, and most particularly the language that's used to describe those religious concepts depend utterly on metaphors that come from the first two levels. This is where the metaphors are created and are, uh, and are retained. Okay. Now, what Shepard's saying there is that these successive bondings culminate in the mature sense of the separate self, as opposed to the primitive sense of, or infantile sense of. As he says, individuation then is a prologue to further epigenesis. Now he's seeing self, see, as an ontogenic achievement. It all this adds up to a whole self. I'd suggest that his final stage probably represents all four selves simultaneously, as I was trying to uh, indicate I think this represents this. I'll show, try to show you this uh, um, as a, these four cells are kind of an ontogenic process. In the middle, in the beginning, here we were sitting in the beginning, you know, individual, which I've already uh, labeled as being infantile. This could be considered both uh, as ontogeny and as an evolution. Okay. That's the core. Then the instant, the next thing is group, as I said. Now, from a, I can also call that social. This is asocial in a setting. The very same these this group consciousness, your group self, is necessity that awareness of group self, let's put it that way, is necessitated by the social context. By the fact that one is in a social context. Alright. The next would be community. And by raising the word community, I am obviously saying multi-specific paradigm. Ecologic. You can I call it ecologic or multi-specific? These are cells that are developing. So. Ecologic. Community self is an ecologic participation. Individual participation. Social participation. Ecologic. Now the whole is a person of good old fire spirit, which is whole. Whole works. But in Shepherd's terminology, I would call this mature being. Mature being necessitating the four levels. Don't give me an individual self as being a mature. A mature state for any kind of work. Okay. So this is what self consciousness is, according to this. Our society systematically, in our culture, restricts it to this. To this perfectly reptilian core. All right. So it's autogenic, this coming up this way, isn't it? It's, it's playing with this and playing with no. I think it integrates the four levels you see of consciousness, I think, um, synthesizes or at least rationalizes them. I reckon that's what Paul is doing over here. So that's, that's all right. Uh, we can play with that infinite period of time. So I'm trying to show, as I say, the four cells, both as an ontogenic process, well, an individual development, and as a description of participating consciousness in an ecologic or environmental context, okay. So the Shepherd's three bonds, one, two, three, go I can put I can put it's quite easy. The three bonding events, not bonds, but bonding events. Better. Here. 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 Here.
<coughs> now, in that scheme uh, of mine, the individual self, and implicit in it, I didn't put it, but implicit in that is that the concept of individual self and also the concept of other, both of them, diminish in significant as we move outward, as we hopefully mature. Okay. The individual self being transcended by Paul Shepard's bond number one there, uh, and other decrease, decreases systematically or gradually in a slight in importance uh, from the social group through the ecologic community, interspecies the whole being. Awareness sessions or something called biospheric participation. I forgot the biospheric something. Consciousness, I guess. Biospheric consciousness. I think with George Session said that. Anyway, self is gone. And being has subsumed self at the mature intellectual, emotional, and ecologic levels. All three. Okay. What you have is at this basic individual infantile level, you've got what? Motor functions, at least you've got that. You've got this encapsulated ego, screaming bloody murder for attention in the universe. You've got competition, I think, at an infantile level. Competition for attention there. Striving, I think striving is there, and it's also infantile. Subject, object, I believe is also infantile. And the infantile level, whether it's Paul's or mine, blends into the resourcist mode, if you like, at the shallowest level of the group. Then at the group social level, you've got emerging cooperation beginning. Starts there, somewhere there. You've got emerging compliance with the greater good. You've got emerging, very basic, but there, symbiosis, emerging at the group social level. Clearly you've got family, kin, band, all that stuff. But it's still speciesist, because it's my family, right or wrong, by extension of my species. So it is still speciesist in its worldview. Still, us baboons are more important than those vervets. Still resourcist in the interest of the group. Still group self as opposed to that other stuff out there. And there's some intra-species competition and all that kind of stuff and aggressiveness at that low level of the group self. Still, at the interspecies level, oh no, we're just going through, we're going up the scale. Sorry if we're talking about up and down hierarchy. I'm only human. I can't. Yeah, my ancestors were Calvinists. I can't help talking about it. I'll try. At the, at the interspecies, the ecologic level, the community level, you get interspecies reciprocity. Very important. Utterly important. You get ecologic compliance, which is a state greater than interpersonal compliance okay at that level where you've got total ecologic compliance and if you don't like compliance you may not you can say participation but ecologic at that stage otherness is gone it has lost meaning it no longer has a role in the conceptual universe it no longer has a role in functioning as a healthy blue-blooded beings. Okay. Then at the final stage, uh, at the ultimate ideal stage, whether it's reachable or not, I don't give a hoot, but at, theoretically at that stage, cosmological biospheric whole. I suspect that means death, but I'm not going to get into that. But I think that the consciousness of biospheric wholeness may be uh, at death. I suspect it might be. And of course, at death, then the conversation of life goes on, and all has not been wasted. This is why I see this, uh, the self and all the, 
that's an ideal statement, I, I grant you, that I've given you, but uh, it, it upsets me terribly to see this emphasis on such a primitive level of, of participation and uh, understanding. And I think Shepherd helps us. That book is hard to get because it was never published in Canada. There's copies around. Diane has my copy. I can blame her publicly for that, but she hasn't had it long. So. There are some around. I recommend it to you. The, what, what, when you do see it, if you do want to look at it in this context, this is not the same in the book as what I gave you today. This is a more updated one, as I mentioned before. So that's all I have to say. Very important, though, and I, nothing conclusive about what I've had to say. I'm simply trying to take a different cut at some things that are awfully, awfully given and assumed and taken as granted in our culture. Out of curiosity, um, in the Niagara Scarpin episode of The Nature of Things, oh, yeah. you sort of suggest that that the dichotomy, the sense of uh, not understanding that we are other species, you alluded to that. Did you get any reaction? Oh, I did, yeah. I talked about there was a baby fawn, and I remember saying that yeah. she needed the experience of imprinting upon her surroundings just as the human child does. Was that like? That it's so long since I did that, that film, I've forgotten, but yeah, something like that. I forget there was an image of a bird on the screen, but you were talking about a loss of sense of we are them and they are us and so on. Yeah. Um, did you get any reaction from that? Oh, you do. Just, only cranks write letters. Yeah. Only cranks write letters. Unfortunately, people like it, they never tell you. Uh, no, I got little to that. There's a profound danger in, in abstracting too much and those things I know about. People who don't like it are usually more propelled to write than people who do. People who do go and have a coffee, and uh, that was nice, and people who don't like it fall with the mouth and go to their typewriter. So, <laughs> well, disliking creates a greater know, energy yeah. drive than liking. It was only subtle. No, I know they don't. No, you don't get that stuff. It's a waste. Pearls on the television, there's pearls on, you know, so I was here. The pearls aren't picked up on television, believe me. So, who wants to uh, take on take on selfness? Name names if you know. Anybody like to look at Maslow's uh, conventional uh, hierarchy in these terms? Because it's kind of interesting. I don't care. I don't know. Who, I don't know who knows about that. Nobody wants to, t nobody turned on by this uh, whole thing. It really turns me on. I'm surprised to find. Well, I am glad you did one. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have it every time, Mike, but. Uh, Who did I hear? Who else did I hear? Vicky? Do you okay? Give it a go to All right, that's fine. See, it all needs is one. I don't need three each time, but the more you do, the more fun it is anyway, so that's fine. Okay. You're on. Do try if you do. We have somebody here with social psych background? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, do we? No. Yep. Okay. Look at the math off just for fun and see. Well, you know it anyway. I mean, you know, you know it. What? I guess so. No, but there's still this drive, this progressive drive. That's all. I don't care about math off's categories. Please, I didn't mean that. I meant this drive toward uh, the assumption that. Uh, that self-awareness being the apogee and the peak. And, wow, when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Wow, when you think about it. So I would like your criticisms of mine and, and Paul. Sorry, that's what I want. Okay. Any more? Is there any question? What time is it? Do we have time for a little bit of questions? I'm going back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got a little time. I've got to go to something. I've got to cut a little bit short. But yeah, we have some time. I'd just like to ask at the level of the of uh, the biosphere. Um, do you do you see any parallels between the when people are talking about Gaia consciousness and your concept? No, I do not. You don't. No. Do you want a short thing? A couple of minutes on the yeah. Gaia hypothesis? Yeah. 
Do you know the, the hypothesis Tayyar de Chardin, the French Jesuit mystic and paleontologist? Does everybody know about this, what I'm talking about? Tayyar in the early, okay, Tayyar in the early part of this century, in the 20s, was a Jesuit priest, T H E I L H A R D de Chardin, T H E R D N, was a, a paleontologist, and he was involved with that Canadian who discovered Pithecanthropus erectus. Cyanthropus, Peking man thing, Homo erectus now. That was in the early 20s, some Canadian guy from McGill and Tyre were there anyway. The fact of evolution, Tyre could not deny. It was there. He was a, a very well informed man. But he was a Jesuit. What was he going to, what was he going to do with that? If I'm bad mouthing him, you correct me, but this is about what it is. Um, he postulated an evolutionary kind of determinism in which evolution is taken as given, but the supreme flowering, the supreme achievement of evolution preordained was, guess who? Uh, God's plan was to set this age-old process in motion so as to produce this in his image. Okay? But even more than the simple necessity of his image having been created on earth through this long, terrible, terrible, pretty costly thing when you think of the millions upon millions of species that had to be rendered extinct in order to deliver the, uh, the humility of it to establish it. <laughs> anyway, the world becomes whole. The world becomes whole with a great thing called the noosphere, the sphere of knowledge. There's the biosphere. He speaks of the biosphere, actually. He talks of the biosphere. But beyond it, which is the noosphere, because knowing transcends being. Okay, remember who we're talking about. So, knowing is far more important than, this is more important than my blood or my, uh, you know. It envelops the earth. Once all things are known to all, uh, then in that final reflection, it's over. Evolution was set in motion 4.5 billion years ago in order to achieve this moment of universal knowing, and then the reason for evolution having been satisfied, it's over. It's literally over. All this is gone. Now, he talks about self.